now that we have a second device, we have an iPad that also has a camera on it. When you guys have a question or you want to answer a question, we can bring you that iPad and you can speak directly to me and I can speak directly to you. So great. Okay, we have a lot to do today. If you guys remember, at the end of the last class, we were talking about the fact that there were 9.4 million Jews, right? Oh, wait, you know what? We're going to start with our Israel moment first, and then we'll get back to the last class. So our Israel moment, I'm taking you two nights early to what's happening this week. Okay, who can guess what's going on this week? It's going on in, in America as well as in Israel. Jerry, you want to call on someone? Yeah, the young lady next to you had her hand up first, I think. Okay. Uh, Hanukkah. Hanukkah is coming this week. Now, everyone can see this slide over here. Does anyone have any idea what this is? No. Uh, chocolate. Okay. Chocolate. Could be. It's not. It's actually made of stone. Thank you. It's a rock, but what does it look like? This actually was discovered a year ago in Israel, and it looks like a stone, but, but think more carefully. Think about its shape, and think about its size, and think about what it could look like. Ah, okay, a coin. It's actually not an Egyptian coin. It was a coin that was found a year ago in Israel, from the time of the Maccabees, or from exactly the time of the Hanukkah story. So that's why it's here in our What's Happening in Israel this week. And over here, you know, in Israel, what do you guys eat at home to celebrate Hanukkah? Any special foods? Latkes. Latkes, latkes. So when I lived in New Jersey, we used to eat latkes, and everyone we knew was, was busy making latkes for Hanukkah. But in Israel, it's kind of hard to find places that make and sell latkes. People can make them in their homes, but everywhere in Israel, in every supermarket, in every store, on every street corner, you find people selling sufganiyot, which is a very famous Israeli Hanukkah food. And places like you see here actually have menus of sufganiyot, and only on Hanukkah or two months before Hanukkah until the end of Hanukkah, to all these places make all these specialty donuts, which are the food that Bardi Jews traditionally ate, like Ashkenazi Jews ate latkes. Bardi Jews ate dough fried in oil for Hanukkah. So we'll be busy in Israel this week eating lots and lots of donuts. Okay, taking us back to where we were last week. Last week we ended class by looking at the number of Jews that there were. We had looked a little bit at what life was like in pre-Shoah Europe, and we looked at the fact that there were 9.4 million Jews in Europe before the Shoah. And now we're going to take a look at what happened and what led up to the Shoah. So I'm gonna ask you guys to click on, you're gonna click on tinyurl.com backslash AI Lori 4. So everyone should put into their iPads, tinyurl.com backslash A-I-Lori, L-O-R-I, four. And if you need help, you can ask the person next to you or raise your hand. And Jerry, I don't know if we have um, assistance in the class today. Again? Do we have helpers in the class today? Yes. Oh, okay, great. So if you can't get into the tiny URL, just raise your hand so someone can come to help you. But otherwise, everybody should be typing in www.tinyurl.com backslash, backslash AI Lori 4. And when you're in, when you're in, everybody to come on to slide number three. Okay. 
And right. you guys are coming in. Those of you who need help coming in, just raise your hand and Jerry will make sure that someone gets to you. Those of you who are in should come into slide number three. You're going to click here where it says Lino board, who were the Nazis? Okay, you're in, you're in. You're really good. Raise your hand. No. That's going to be you. If you haven't gotten in, just raise your hand and wait patiently. Those of you who are in, you're going to come onto this lino board. If you look up at the screen now, in the middle of the lino board, it says, please watch the video, Rise of the Nazis. And then you're going to read the four sections. There are four post-its numbered one, two, three, and four. After you've watched the video, you're going to read. Nobody should be doing anything yet because now we're getting directions. All you're right, going everyone. to watch the video. Then you're going to read the four post-its in order. And then I'd like you to write one question concerning the information that you got from the video and post-its one through four. Your question can be clarifying or explaining something you read, or it can be a question about the information you read. And once you post your question, I want you to try to answer someone else's question. But no one should be posting anything now because there's no way that anyone has had time to watch the videos and read all four of the yellow post-its, one through four. So no one should be posting anything at this point. We should be watching the video and we should be reading. There's the video, the rise of the Nazis, and you press play. And if you guys have ear earbuds, it would be a good idea to put in your earbuds so that nobody disturbs anyone else while they watch the video. Yeah. Jerry. Yeah, if people, yeah. if most people don't have earbuds, we could all watch no, this together. Do. Most do. Great, fantastic. Most. Great, great. Oh, yeah. If you guys, if someone does not have an earbud, share with someone. Um, I don't know where the earbuds go in. I don't. You don't have earbuds at all? Okay, so the earbuds, you guys are sharing. Are you two sharing? Great, so you two are going to share. Um, Here you go. I don't know where the outlet for the earbuds go. Does anybody not have earbuds? Where do the earbuds go? On all right, you have to share. Share with him. After we start the video, you should be share. Uh, I can raise your hand. Raise your hand so that Jerry or someone comes to you and they can show you where the earbuds go. Okay, so everyone should be watching this video and then reading the four post-its about who the Nazis were and how they came to power. Then you can start posting your questions and comments. Is the video here not working for anybody? No, we don't know what it's working for. Is the video here working for everybody? Where's hers? Where's hers? Oh, Does everybody have headphones? Everybody's videos working? Everyone's good? Okay, good. Are okay. okay. you able to hear the video? Yeah. You ready to hear the video? Correct. You ready to hear the video?
After you watch the video, you're going to go through reading one, the information on posted one through four. And then you're going to start posting your questions or comments about the information that you reviewed. <laughs> when you guys have a question, remember you click on the post it and then you can write and you can post. Mm -hmm. now, now, now that you've watched the video, you can you can write your questions. Well, now that you've watched the video, you're going to read the information on these post-its, one through four, which you need this information to really understand how the numbers came to power, and then you're going to write your questions and your comments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, Jessica posted a very interesting question. Some of that is answered or has some idea to answer Jessica's questions are found on the post-its, on the yellow post-its, but maybe someone wants to take a shot at answering Jessica's question. Why couldn't the Germans see that what Hitler was doing was wrong? So if anyone has any ideas about that, you can post an answer to Jessica's question. If you can ask a question, any question about it, or if you suggest Jessica had a question, you can post a, a response to her question. Okay, guys, but remember, in, ans in posting your comments, we're posting something which is new information, a question, or a response to something which you learned here on the Lino. Mm -hmm. What chairs? What chairs? Okay. Uh, interesting question that Jackson poses also that we're going to see. Anybody have any ideas about that? When did the Germans learn that it was wrong? Oh. Okay, I don't know who, whoever posted this pink post, it didn't identify themselves, but that could be one answer to Jessica's question or one idea. The Germans themselves had been in a, in a terrible situation financially. They were in a terrible depression. They were hungry, they were without jobs, and they were probably willing to believe anything to have better lives. So maybe that's how Hitler kind of came to power. Oh, does anyone have any ideas? How did Hitler declare himself Fuhrer after the leader died? How did Hitler come to power? Can anyone answer that for Eli? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. Lori, do you want someone to type in the answer? You want to yes. hear them? You can type it in. Type it in, and we'll all see the same thing. How did Hitler get to appoint himself as president? Is that what happened? You guys have to read the information carefully and listen to the information carefully. Can someone answer, Shana and Eli? Answer me. How did Hitler die? Did any people pretend to not be Jewish so they didn't get into trouble? Danica, we're going to look a lot at that over the next few weeks. Okay, Eli to Jessica, could, uh, that could absolutely be true. Again, a similar type of idea, the German felt powerless and Hitler promised them a beautiful future. Maybe they just were attracted to that. Uh, what made Hitler decide to blame the Jews and a different group? Anyone have any ideas about that? Great question, Jordan. If you have ideas, guys, or answers, you have to post them so that everybody can see them. Right, Abby, you kind of answered your own question, but absolutely. Um, why did the Nazi party believe it? One of their central beliefs, their main belief, was they blamed the Jews for everything. Why that was, Jordan? We're going to take a look at some of that. Going back to Shana and Eli's question. Did Hitler appoint himself leader? How did Hitler become Chancellor of Germany, guys? Well, President appointed How did Hitler get become her Chancellor of Germany? He appointed himself. No, Okay. You want to know an interesting thing, guys? <laughs> Uh, the Weimar, guys, look up at the screen. The Weimar Republic, Germany, and Germany was a democracy. Hitler was elected Chancellor of Germany. He actually ran an election and was elected Chancellor. He won enough support by the German people to be elected in a democracy. Okay, guys, I think we have a sense, I think we have a pretty good sense that in the 1930s, in the early 1930s, as a result of after World War I, which ended in 1918, through the 1920s, Germany was really suffering. The economic situation in Germany was very bad. The political situation in Germany was very bad. And that kind of created the vacuum for Hitler and his ideas to come in. So you see the Nazis rise to power or beginning to rise to power. Can anybody look at these pictures? And can anybody tell me if you recognize any of these symbols and what they are? Jerry, do you want to call on someone? Sure. Yeah. Uh, Parker, you have the, uh, yeah. I had, here we go. Yeah. What's up? Uh, the Jewish symbol, uh, that's like a Jewish symbol that Germans put on Jews in like concentration camps to like know who they were. Okay, so you're talking about the picture in the middle, and if, if most of us, most of the time it was a yellow star, sometimes it was white and blue, but it was a symbol to kind of humiliate the Jews and identify them as Jewish. Another one of the other pictures. The other one is the, the, the one on the left, the first one is the Nazi symbol. And then the, uh, the last one, I think, is the best one, all the Germans. Right, the big salute at the Germans, a big German crowd saluting, probably an important Nazi official was there, 
and the Nazi cloth sticker. Okay. Um, now I'd like you guys to take a look at these pictures. These are cartoons, these are characters, and I want you to think about when do you think these pictures were drawn and what do you think is being spoken about? And I know you guys probably don't speak German, but I think you could get a sense even from the words in German and the picture over here, certainly in this picture on the right and down in this bottom picture. What do you think these cartoons are about? And when do you think they might have been drawn or written? And you know what, Jake? For some reason, the iPad is not working, so people will have to come to the camera. Can you hear him? No, I'm having a hard time hearing. Okay, there's a guess. Speak louder. Yeah, speak a little bit louder, right? Um, we have to talk to the camera. I'm, I'm sorry, the iPad is not working. Oh, she's not seeing you on the iPad. Get it. Come over here. Um, I think the picture to the um, yeah, that one um is the um. And it lo looks like it's like in where World War Two is, like a really long time ago, with um them like eating, and okay. um I'm, like can kind you, of. Can you guess who any of these are? Can you guess who you might think this picture is trying to say? Who is this person over here? The very heavy, fat person, the glutton. It looks like um one of the. It looks like one of the presidents. Okay. Anybody, Jordan, you have a different idea? Uh, yeah. Uh, I think the fat person is supposed to be a Jewish person. He's like, okay. the right on the right is supposed to be a German because they didn't have a lot of food. And they're saying like, the Jews have a lot of food. Uh, and then the second one, um, it looks like the Jews are like a spider and they're going to like take over kind of Germany. Okay, wait, 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 wait. wait. Let's, let's stop for a second and just make sure everyone's with you because you interpreted that cartoon beautifully. The guy on the right, the starving looking, taken advantage of, who has no food and is like kind of innocent and, and being taken advantage of is the German. And the fat, greedy, gluttonous person over here, and even said it's called, he's called the banker with a big nose, is supposed to be the Jew. And it's supposed to show people in the newspaper that the Jews take advantage of the Germans. Okay, go on to the right one. Uh, it looks like uh, the spider is a Jewish person, the person in the web is a German person, and they're kind of like ca capturing them and taking over. Okay, so stop for a second. That's going to be very important. That's something we're going to look at next. Imagine you're a young person or even an adult, and you're opening up your newspaper, and you're seeing pictures like this all the time. Here's the Jewish man. is like a spider, and he's out to grab the young, beautiful, innocent, German women. So it's these ideas, they look kind of, they're comics, but they're these ideas, they're very racial comics, beginning to create serious stereotypes to help you. Some of you asked, why did the Germans go along? Every day in the newspapers in the 1930s, you're seeing pictures like this that are telling a story and painting the picture. And what about this one down here? I think that like the, the person in the middle might be the Jew. Really? No, no, uh, that's the German in the middle. And the Jews are like the people on the like the left and right. Like that the German they like, they should like make like make way for the Germans. So exactly. The German here is the blonde, tall, strong, Aryan looking person. And the Jews are very stereotypical. How many Jews do you know that look like this? Very stereotypical kind of greedy, big noses, ugly people who might try to take advantage of the beautiful Aryan. Okay, guys. So the Germans used a lot of propaganda. They used newspapers. They used movies. Remember, there was no internet in these days. There were no smartphones where people got their information. Everybody got their information from the newspaper maybe from a news reel or a movie that you would go to on the weekends. And in the 1930s, Germans were bombarded constantly with pictures and ideas like this. 
And in 1935 to 1938, the Germans began passing laws against the Jews. So let's look here. If this is like a, a Pictionary, and you have to put these pictures into order, I'd like someone other than Jordan. Look at these pictures. Based on the information that we got already about the Nazis and how they came to power, what would be the first picture in the story of the Nazis' rise to power? Jerry, can you call on the young person right next to you? Right there, right in the back. Right in the back. Who's raised her hand? Yes, every time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I did. <laughs> Good. Um, the first picture, the, the first picture would be the um, the one where it says Germany punished German losses territory. Absolutely, Germany loses territory. World War One ends here already. The Germans start to feel like victims. Then what? Uh, then it would be the economy depression. Economic depression. The economy tanks. And then what happens? The, the one on the bottom with Hitler coming to power? Hitler rises to power. This is a little trickier to figure out. What would be um, the next thing? The one with the, like, the Jew. Okay. But before we can get to the actual laws, putting stars on Jews, oh, making laws about Jews. The one with the lamp. Or the, the one the with the goat, right? The scapegoat, right? Hitler blamed everything on the Jews. And then he began taking action against the Jews. Excellent. And then the Nazis are in power. Great. Okay. So in 1935, the Germans began. 1933, Hitler's elected chancellor. 1935, the Germans started putting into law Nazi attitudes about the Jews. And I'm going to ask you all on your own iPads if you can click in where it says here Nuremberg Laws. That was the name of the laws that began to be legislated against the Jews. So if you guys click in here where it says Thing Link. Did anybody look at that? You're going to come to a picture of a large yellow star. This is a picture of an actual star that someone wore during World War II. And I want you guys to take a few minutes to learn about the Nuremberg Laws. And what you see here is there are these black and white dots. So if you start in the upper triangle about the Nuremberg Laws and you go clockwise, you'll read some stories about what the Nuremberg Laws were about how they affected people. You'll get some personal examples and stories of how they affected people. And over here is a short little video about the Nuremberg Laws. And there are lots of different aspects, meaning the Nuremberg Laws said lots of different things and made life very difficult for the Jews between 1935 and 1938. I want you guys to take a few minutes and learn about what the Nuremberg Laws were and their impact on German Jewry between 1935 and 1938. So you're going to take a few minutes, everyone on your own, to kind of navigate this star. Okay, guys. If anyone isn't on the thing link or can't figure out how to use it, you can raise your hand. We're good. Everybody's on.
Basically, four big categories of things the Nuremberg Law did to the Jews were forced on the Jews. And I want you guys to be thinking about that as you go through, because in a minute, I'm going to ask you guys to respond and tell me what the Nuremberg Laws were, what you think their impact on German Jewry was. Okay, guys, take another couple of minutes to finish up here. Guys, as you finish up, I'm going to ask you to come back here to slide number eight. And I'm going to ask you to think about how did the Nuremberg Laws impact daily Jewish life in, in Germany? And what were the Nazis trying to make the Jews feel like and look like to non-Jews? So once you guys have finished, you're going to come back into slide eight and you're going to flip into this today's meet where you can put your name and join and then you're going to answer how did the Nuremberg laws impact life in Germany what were they trying to make them feel like and look like to others so the Nuremberg laws had some very specific goals Remember, you have to type in your name to join, and then you can post a message. Wait, I'm, I'm sorry, Lori, I missed it. How do they get into today's meet? So they're going to come back onto the slide show. They were on slide seven. They're going to come onto slide eight, and they're just going to click through here, and it will bring them to the today's meet. Okay. You hear that? How do you get to today's meet? You're going to come to slide eight in your slideshow and just click into how did the Nuremberg Laws impact daily life. Just click there and it will bring you right to the today's meet. May Jews feel despised. Try to, okay, so what did these laws do? 
made you feel unwanted, despised, outsiders. You guys hit it on the head. Okay, try to protect German blood. How? Imagine you guys are 11 year olds living in Germany. How did the Nuremberg, what kind of things did the Nuremberg Law say, and how would this change your life or impact on your life? For sure, this has made them give up their homes. Oftentimes, made them give up their homes and businesses. One of the things that the Nazis said was that the Jews were no longer allowed to own businesses. That worked for doctors, lawyers, teachers, also professors were dismissed. Doctors and lawyers who work in their professions. And anybody who owns a business, it could be taken away from them. Ultimately, we'll see also home made them feel unwanted. What other things did the Germans did the Germans make you do? One thing is they took away their businesses, their belongings. What other things did the Nuremberg Laws do? Humiliate was certainly a big piece. Oh, interesting, Max, very interesting what Max wrote, because actually there was a lot of crossover. The Nazis took some of their ideas from racial laws in the United States. So Max writes, the laws basically made Germany into America with black and white, which at that time, there were a lot of similar laws. Blacks weren't allowed to go to a lot of the same places as whites or drink from the same water fountains, use the same bathrooms. That's exactly where the Nazis got a lot of the Nuremberg laws. So what kind of things, somebody start posting, what kind of specific things? One thing we know it impacted Jews' work, their businesses were taken away, their belongings could be taken away. How else did it impact on the lives of Jews? What else did the Nuremberg law say? She's typing. You see what you see? What Lori's typing up there, guys? What happened to their names? How would that make you guys feel? You guys are never seeing that, but all Jewish people had to carry an identity card marked with a big J. They were being singled out, and they had to change their middle names. They thought that Jews were worthless and shouldn't be able to do okay. But guys, there was a goal in the Nuremberg Laws to define something differently than had been defined before. Before, if you were a Jewish person and you wanted to become Christian, if you wanted to convert, you could become a Christian and then you were no longer considered Jewish. So in the Middle Ages, if there were times when Jews were prejudiced against or had pogroms, if you became a Christian, you were okay. What did the Nuremberg Law say? I wouldn't like it, my middle name, right? The whole name thing. I would run away or die, okay? Somebody said you find that very, very dramatic what Max wrote. Okay, in two weeks, I want to ask you if you still find it so, dra so dramatic. Um, so hold that thought. Max put up there something that to us now looks extreme and dramatic. I would run away or die if these laws were being put in my face. But guys, someone answer my question. How... Could a Jew convert to Christianity and no longer be Jewish? How did the Nuremberg Laws define Jews? Guys, write it in so that everybody can see it, please. Write it in. Write it in. Okay, compared to other changes, having to change your middle name would not be so bad. 
Some people would find that very, very, very humiliating to be told what their middle name had to be. Okay, Hannah, you were considered Jewish. If you had three Jewish grandparents, you were considered fully Jewish. The Nazis also made these crazy, if you really read that chart, crazy definition. If you had only two Jewish grandparents, sometimes they considered you Jewish, sometimes they considered you like a Mischling or a half person, and you had some prejudice things, but sometimes you were okay. And if you had only one Jewish grandparent, they also defined it. But okay, now suddenly they're defining it, like Eliana said, like Hannah said, racially. If you're born to Jewish grandparents, they're defining you Jewish. And it doesn't matter what you think your religion is. Even if you became a Catholic, there's no way out of it. Once a Jew, always a Jew. Okay, Max agrees with that, but that was certainly the Nazi's idea. Okay, anything else that we saw there? There was another idea. We saw businesses being taken over. We saw Jews being singled out and identified. We saw Jews being racially defined. And what was the other big thing that the Nuremberg Law said could not happen? The Nuremberg Laws made it illegal. Okay, Eli's being also very dramatic, but you know, it looks to us extremely dramatic now. We're going to see in a couple of weeks what we think. Okay, Jews couldn't walk into places where it said no Jews allowed, but what was the other big thing that Jews were not allowed to do? They, they couldn't work. We've said all these things already. What were the other things that Jews couldn't do? No Jews could what? Couldn't marry. Thank you, Worley. Jews and Germans couldn't get married to each other. Now, guys, something that you have to know is that in Germany at this time, a lot of Jews were very, very assimilated. They weren't necessarily very religious. And they were very intelligent. They went to university. They were very successful as a community. And there were many Jews who were married to non-Jews. All of a sudden, who you loved and who you were allowed to be married to was defined by the state. And it became a crime for a non-Jewish person to be married to a Jew or a Jew to be married to a non-Jewish person. So between 1935 and 1938, all of these laws came into play. And life began to become more and more difficult for the Jews as we're going to see. So in 1938, anybody hear of this event? We, there was just a big 70th anniversary of it, Kristallnacht. Did anybody hear of this event? Okay, we're going to take a look at what this was. And what the Nazis said it was, and what it really became. So, what? Sorry. We're going to watch this little clip, which is going to tell you the excuse the Nazis used for Kristallnacht. <laughs> This was a huge, horrific act that took place all across Germany. 267 synagogues were burned down or destroyed. 30,000 Jewish men, mostly young and healthy, 
were thrown into concentration camps. 91 were killed that night, and 7,500 Jewish-owned stores were destroyed. Now, who picked up? Why did the Nazis say they did this? What was Kristallnacht about, according to the Nazis? Go ahead, Jordan. Um, uh, one Jewish person uh, killed uh, a Nazi diplomat, so they decided that they put revenge, kind of. Okay, so just a little bit of background on that story. Herzl Greenspan was a young German Jew living in Paris. His parents were German Jews who, like many German Jews, originally came from Poland. In this time, in 1938, the Nazis deported. They took many Jews who were German citizens, stripped them of their citizens, and dumped them back to Poland. But Poland didn't want them either. And these Jews were stuck out in the middle of the winter in kind of a no man's land, in very cruel circumstances. Because of that, this young man was so impassioned to act, he went into the German embassy in Paris, and he shot a diplomat who wound up dying. And the Nazi then enacted Kristallnacht across Germany. But again, this was not something spontaneous, where maybe one store was destroyed or one synagogue was burned. You can look at the numbers up on the screen and see that this was something well-planned, well-organized, that took place across the country and devastated the German Jewish community. So I want us to look at a video where some people who were survivors of Kristallnacht are speaking. They were children your age or younger at the time, and they speak about their experience. The real significance of Kristallnacht was that it marked a huge escalation of Nazi anti-Semitism. 900 synagogues were desecrated or set on fire. 91 Jews were killed that night. And 30 30,000 Jewish men, a quarter of all of the Jewish men in Germany, were taken to concentration camps. Not only were businesses destroyed that night, but the Jewish community and life as Jews had known it was also destroyed. You are traumatized. Traumatized, you cannot understand what's going on. Here, you have a loving family, being torn apart, crawled into this stack of tires and sat there for three days, and no food, water, or anything. And all you looked for was to live the next minute, the next hour, the next day, and do another day and just continue on that way. When you think about that, you do not sleep. Oh, if you do sleep, you sleep very light. I was six years old on Crystal Nacht, and um, I was going to kindergarten that day, and all of a sudden we heard this banging on the door, and uh, Nazis broke in the door with their boots, and the thing I remember the most are the boots, you know? When I see somebody in boots, black boots, it comes back to me, you know, because they kicked the door down with those black boots. When we started searching for an exhibit specifically on crystal Okay, so now we're in November of 1938, and the Nazis have kind of taken off the gloves, because until that time, from 1933 to 1938, Lots of bad things have happened. Some of you responded, and we thought it was a little extreme when some people were saying, I would run away, or I would kill myself, or I would want to die when the Nuremberg laws were passed. But we saw a lot of extreme things happening in 1933 to 1938 that were changing the lives of the Jews. But all of a sudden now, there is such a mass wave of violence. No more pretending that maybe it'll be okay, a serious wave of violence directed at all the Jews across Germany. 
So if we had to put together, I was going to have you guys go in and each of you do it in the but I'm going to ask you to look up at the screen just in the interest of time. And we had to decide what happened between 1933, even before 1933, to 1939. How would we put these events in order? What would be the first event in the squares on the bottom? Barry, do you want to call on someone? Yeah, yeah, I'm doing that. I'm doing that. Okay. Okay. The first event is um, while in prison, Hitler writes a book against Jews. Uh, absolutely. While in, while in prison, uh, I'm going to have to go into the slide to do it. Okay, one second. While in prison, Hitler writes a book called Mein Kampf where he spells out all of his plans, what he intends to do to the Jews, and he encourages people. Whoops. Okay. Okay, next. What happened next? Who wants to go? Someone else want to go? How about the same people? How about some new people? Go ahead. Shana, come, we gotta come up here. Shana. Um, Hitler becomes Chancellor of Germany. Okay, when does Hitler become Chancellor of Germany? Um, 1933, Hitler becomes Chancellor of Germany. Okay, so absolutely, Hitler becomes Chancellor of Germany, 1933. Okay, what would be the next thing that happened? Yeah, Jessica. The next thing that happened would be uh, the Nuremberg laws are introduced. And when are the Nuremberg laws introduced? Um, 1935, I think. 1935, between 1935, we'll stretch it a little. Between 1935 and 1938, all the Nuremberg laws are introduced. And what would be the next thing? Yeah. Um, the Night of Broken Glass. Kristallnacht, which takes place when? 1937. Takes place when? 1937. Takes place when? 1938. November 1938. Absolutely. And does anyone know when Germany invades Poland in World War II begins? Go ahead, Jordan. 1939. 1939. Do you know the date? Um, September or November something. Mitsuyan, September 1st, 1939, and we're going to come back to that date. So this guy gives you, you can look at this timeline and kind of see the wave of how the Nazis came to power and how it didn't take them long at all to introduce the Nuremberg Laws did not take it long at all for the Nuremberg Laws to seriously affect German Jewry until we got to Kristallnacht. And um, life has radically changed for German Jewry. We're going to pick up next week with, I'm going to ask you guys, so it's something you can pick up before you come to class next week. I'm gonna ask you guys to write a short journal entry for me as if you were a 12 year old or an 11 year old living in Germany in the 1930s, 1938 specifically after Kristallnacht and ask you how you think you might have felt. Okay, so you guys can be thinking about that between now and when we get together again next Sunday. Okay, so thank you very much for learning. Today. Hanukkah, that was my words. Chag Orim Sameach, Hanukkah Sameach to everyone. I hope you guys have a great week. I hope in addition to Lakas that you'll try some Sufganiyot. And I will see you uh, towards the end of Hanukkah. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye.